Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ian McNichol. It's my pleasure today to be asked to give you a, an introduction to Open Air. It's spelled Open EHR, Electronic Health Record, but we say Open Air. So my background is as a family doctor in Scotland, um, but I, for the last uh, 15 years or so, I've been working full time as an uh, independent clinical informatician, uh, but working with Open Air technologies for most of that time. So what is open air? Um, it's a specification. It's a specifica specification uh, published under an open source license for a standardized patient centric health information system. So it's not an application. Uh, you can't go to the open air uh, GitHub repository and download the source code for, for an EPR or EHR app. It's actually <clears throat> about the design. It's about the blueprints for a health information system. But it does allow people to build applications on top of it. It supports this idea we call an open platform ecosystem, and it's designed to be vendor technology and license neutral. In other words, it will allow uh, the development on top of the open specifications. It allows the development of both closed source and open source applications. The Open Air International Organization is a nonprofit uh, industry, clinical, clinical informatician, and health organization collaborative uh, funded by our members. Um, more about that later. Uh, that's our website, Open Air International at openehr.org. The IP is uh, owned for some technical reasons by our partner and original uh, uh, organization, the Open Air Foundation. So before we go into what is open air, let's try to just define the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we understand, all of us who are, who are in this space understand natively that this is a very complex information environment. Uh, we have a huge number of specialist activities, specialist services, organizations, and those organizational boundaries come and go. They're uh, limited by culture and politics, and they're forever changing. And the only thing really that's constant at the heart of that is the patient. Uh, that's the only constant, is the, the patient and their view of the world and our attempt to, to care for them. Um, because we're trying to build applications that help people in all these different specialties with all these different care contexts, different care pathways and journeys, the application stacks that we've developed are very largely uh, intended to work for those individual specialties and uh, parts of the fragmented system. And what we really need, I think we should argue, is that the, the headline ask, uh, and Bob talked about this in general in slightly different terms, is something that functions as a coherent information system across all of the all of those boundaries of care and uh, and organizations and specialties and we talk about systems um, what do we mean by health IT system very often we just mean the application I used to talk about my GP system uh, in Scotland when I was a GP and you can dive under that what's in that well there's the user interface and there's obviously some kind of database where we actually store the data then there's also the, what we might call the logical information model. So that's what would normally be in a program language such as C or JavaScript. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, the definition, the structure of a blood pressure recording uh, or end of life care wishes or a lab test. Those things are both modeled and have to be handled by the, the programming language bit, the information model, and also the data storage side, the database. And essentially every little application and big application has their own information model and their own database. And this is what makes it so difficult to communicate between them. Now if we look at this example of a cancer journey. So here's a, here's a part of someone's healthcare where we really want things to join up, whether it's the, the MDT team, whether it's an interim treatment summary, whether it's patient recorded outcomes or their end of life care wishes. That really is a continuum continuum of information that we would want to be handled in a coherent way, not let locked inside different forms and applications. And, and then again, as a burden on care, asking clinicians to re-enter it with the danger that they make mistakes and certainly that things don't get communicated from one sector to the other. So how do we solve the problem? Well, the obvious solution, of course, is just to buy one big system. And most of you will know that the UK had an attempt at that, or more accurately, England had an, an attempt at that through the, uh, the NHS Connecting for Health. And we see that 
partly happening through um, natural market forces is the advent of bigger and bigger mega suite systems that co cover uh, whole hospitals or whole regional areas. But in general, it's unlikely that these are going to be able to manage this fully coherent system. And of course, we have the big disadvantage of commercial vendor lock-in and the technical lock-in. Uh, we lose control as a community and it gets harder and harder for new entrants to get into that market. So apart from some technical and clinical concerns, I think there are some real, if you like, political, socio-political concerns about uh, handing this over to an increasing, uh, increasing monopolistic environment. So the, the, the solution to that is interoperability, and, and Bob talked about this in, the, in his keynote, um, the idea being that, okay, we live with multiple applications, big and small, and we devise a mechanism to let those applications talk to each other and specifically to move bits of structured data between them. That requires us to agree what those bits of structured data are. And if you look at this example, so these are three examples of mental health applications in the UK. And in each case, the engineers and the clinicians have get, got together to define both the information models and the data models, database models, for their different uh, views on bed. Now, they're all in the same uh, problem space. They're all uh, mental health applications. So you would think that their uh, idea of a bed would line up. But of course, they don't because they're speaking to individual clinicians who may have a slightly nuanced view. Um, and then we would try to join all of that up. We find there's a problem that, that Rio's bed does not match up with the one in advanced. So this is where the inter inter idea of an interoperability technologies come in. I'm using HL7 Fire as, as a leading example. That we say, okay, let's, let's define another version of bed. One which is vendor neutral, one which is technology neutral. Uh, and we agree that when we move information from in and out of Rio or in and out of advanced or in and out of Mindwave, that we all agree to use the HL7 fire definition. But because this is a huge task, what we generally do, and certainly the HL7 fire philosophy, is let's just deal with 80% of the problem. Let's deal with the, the key bits of information and the key parts of a bed structure that we really need to move about. So there's a kind of slight dumbing down of the content from the point of view of the application developers. And what you can see is there's an awful lot of other people involved. So there's people like myself get involved in curating those fire models. Um, there are lots of other engineers and clinical safety specialists who have to build the transformations from one system to another with inevitably some loss of meaning in data. And then people like myself as uh, clinical informaticians who do the clinical safety checks on that. So there's a lot of cost involved in this interoperability space and complexity and a lot of duplication of effort. And we can see that in spite of there being some now quite good technologies like HL7 Fire that help us with that, it's still a very difficult job. We're also seeing in parallel, and Bob alluded to this in his talk, the, this kind of advent of what you might call a single, single vendor platform. So this says, look, let's stop all, every application doing its own thing. Let's have a system based on one application, but which then exposes his, its system, its information model in the database to third party applications. And we can see many of the, the big and medium sized systems across the world starting to offer their open APIs. So they're transforming themselves from mega suites into essentially mega suite platforms, allowing third party vendors to build other kinds of applications. And that's definitely a forward step. However, it still gives the control of the information models and the databases, and if you like, the system itself, is still under the control of the vendor. It doesn't loosen that up. It, they retain technical control and they retain commercial control. We want to take that a step further. So the open air view is we, we should be taking that on and going for the same kind of platform idea, but make it vendor neutral. Keep the app separate, but in some way construct a technology base of a vendor and technology neutral data store. We call it a CDR. And to power that by collaboratively developed shared open source information models. And essentially the data store acts as the target for the information models. Those data stores should be, be uh, they are certainly customized, custom, but they're provided by potentially a number of different vendors. But one of the reasons that open air is quite tricky to explain to people who are coming from a, if you like, a traditional system development environment, uh, or indeed the interoperability space, 
is it introduces some quite big uh, and novel ideas for rewiring health IT, which various people, for understandable reasons, quite find quite challenging. So first of all, we have this idea of a patient-centric data platform separating the apps from the data management. And we're aiming for, yes, we keep the user-centered applications, but patient-centered data. Underpinning that is the idea of a ventral vendor neutral CDR, which hides the technology, the actual physical database technology behind an API layer and is fed by a no code um, system. That CDR allows you to store and retrieve and query all of the data inside the CDR without any commercial or technical blockers. The CDR is populated in terms of content with data definitions, information model definitions, you know, what's the definition of a blood, blood pressure or a lab test or a pulse rate. Those are provided by a different clinically led governance layer and a technology that supports that. So it allows people like me and clinical colleagues to define and agree and curate. Well, we manage all of this, certainly the artifacts themselves, we call them archetypes, um, they are managed as open source source artifacts, but the whole methodology of how we request changes make this a, a very fluid methodology that allows us to move quite quickly. We're starting to see the idea of platform taking on. It's still relatively low key, but a number of companies, regions, and indeed uh, national bodies uh, and thought leaders in the space are starting to get the idea uh, that this is the way forward. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. Uh, Tamaj will take you through the story of my model IT uh, and the ability to run this open platform idea alongside the kind of legacy EPR world that we have at the moment. So CDRs, just to reiterate, it's a key part of the open air story. It's a smart no code data store, which natively stores, retrieves and queries open air data via a standardized common API. Critically, all of the data is completely available in a technical sense. It's up to governance and it's the owner in, in terms of the service owner, that by mean the, the healthcare organization or national body. It's not uh, the, the technical uh, provider of the CDR does not control either the data in there or the data definitions. And all of it is completely available without any recourse to engineers. You don't have to go to the CDR providers, engineers and say, can you handle this new kind of data? Uh, can you run this new kind of query? That is all under the control of the uh, service owner of the data store. We use a query language called AQL that's based on the uh, data models that we send to it, not based on the physical data store underlying that. And we have a number of uh, providers of these CDR products, all of which work against the standard open air, uh, open air API uh, CDR definitions. And we're doing a lot of work to make sure that they are all completely compliant and working in harmony. And it should be possible, and indeed is possible, to swap one for the other, and the application layer keeps working exactly the same. So what we need to do, though, is to feed those CDRs, which have no native idea of really detailed clinical content. They work on generic uh, structures that are defined in what we call the reference model. But all of the clinical content definitions are defined in archetypes and templates by, by people like myself. Um, so here we have an example of a WHO performance status archetype, and it's used in the context of a cancer MDT report. Just to reiterate, uh, we have the reference model on the left, then we have two other archetypes, body weight and blood pressure. So the templates allow us to aggregate different archetypes together for a specific use case. The one on the left is a diabetic checkup, so it's using a set of some of those archetypes in the middle, the issue, the weight, the blood pressure. A slightly different subset is also being used in the cardiology clinic template. And what you're seeing is the apps essentially that sit on top of those templates. The templates act as a validation layer, to make sure that the data is, is properly constructed uh, and valid. Um, the nice thing using the architect query language is that we can query data in both. We can query right across so I can say, look, give me all the blood pressures for John Smith, regardless of whether they were taken uh, in the context of the diabetic checkup template or in the context of the cardiology clinic template. Indeed, we can query across all patients, so we can do population queries on the same basis. The tooling that we use is customized, but it's now very mature. Um, 
is an example of uh, one of the archetype designer tools that we use. Uh, this is one that we make available through OpenAir. You can see the website link there, tools.openair.org. Uh, we also have some uh, specialist uh, uh, archetype and template review and curation tools. And that's very powerful for us that are working in the international community to develop and curate those archetypes, make them available, free to use, uh, but get lots and lots of clinicians to get involved in assessing their, their quality. So we have a really vibrant international community working on these now. And you can see we have just short of a thousand archetypes in that space. As a good example of the realities, uh, we did some uh, really interesting work around the, the start of the COVID-19 crisis, kicked off by colleagues in Norway who said, hey, look, we, we think we're going to have to develop um, a uh, suspected COVID uh, screening app. Uh, can we work together internationally to base that on the international archetypes uh, and uh, create some uh, hopefully shareable templates across the world? Um, and I think within 10 days, the first app had the first app was deployed and starting to collect patient data, very largely based on existing international archetypes. We had some parallel work done by colleagues in China who were using, uh, I think, 90% of the international archetypes to do a lot of groundbreaking work in terms of understanding how to manage COVID patients in those very early stages. The YouTube link there will point you to a number of presentations from those of us that were involved in this work. We also get a few misconceptions uh, in the open air world. And one of the questions we're often asked is, well, why should we use open air instead of SNOMED? or other terminologies, and in a sense, like, well, that is the wrong question. So this is always a case of, of uh, open air and other information model technologies should work alongside terminology like, like SNOMED. Um, there are lots of arguments about how, how best to do that, but here's a simple example of, of, if you like, a primary use case for SNOMED and open air playing along nicely. And this comes from a, a real world uh, care home COVID assessment application that I'm developing where we're using a service request archetype, which is one of the, the international archetypes. Um, that archetype has a couple of data points, and you see a whole number of data points, but the ones we're using here are service name and reason for request. And there we're using the SNOMED codes as the values. What is the name of the service? The name of the service is isolation of infection contact. The, the reason for request is exposure to 2019 novel coronavirus. So the, those make, that allows us to do uh, more interoperable models where we combine the standardized archetypes with standardized terminology and internationally used terminology. So open air and SNOMED are absolutely made to work in harmony. Uh, they're not competing in any way and, and each plays to its own strength used this way. Similarly, a, a very common argument we hear is well, why would we not use, just use fire instead of open air? And I think it is a more nuanced ar argument because you know, both have information models, uh, both seem to have some similarities, but in fact, you know, the primary idea between both is quite different. So fire is about that messaging interoperability space that I introduced at the start, whereas open air is much more about this gradual coherence around patient-centric uh, CDRs and data stores. And again, the two worlds must and will play together. Um, the diagram on the left uh, was produced by uh, John Meredith's con uh, uh, colleagues in Wales. And you can see, I think it's just quite a nice conception that these things will play along together and must do. We actually do uh, sometimes uh, do joint modeling effort. And there's a good example, the allergies archetype and the allergy intolerance resource and fire are virtually identical because we did some dual modeling. If you want a more technical view on this, then Alistair Allen's presentation at, uh, at last year's open air event uh, gives you a very good uh, practical understanding of why as an application developer, uh, you might see open air as a good option with fire used to communicate with the wider community. So what's next in our world? Well, we definitely need to be thinking in terms of uh, not just uh, getting the data models into this collaborative shared uh, data platform space, but also the business rules, uh, the clinical decision support, the algorithms, and Cambio have, have now a maturing GDL technology, which is part of the open air specification, uh, which addresses this space. Uh, colleagues have also been working on task planning, which is much more into the, the workflow space. This is still very new. 
uh, but it's starting to reach some maturity and deployment. And again, if you're interested in this, the series of YouTube videos uh, hosted by our colleagues in, uh, in the Nordics uh, are, are a very good guide to that. We're also doing a lot of work around our uh, open air strategy, much better messaging, hopefully clearer, me uh, clear, clearer website as to what, uh, what open air is about and how to get started. I think we'll see the emergence of a lot more tooling to support app developers. And of course, you're going to see more and more clinical models because that's a, a big, big job. So that's me finished. Um, just as a final, uh, hopefully, proof of concept that we can get from clinical ideas into uh, information models and deployment very, very quickly. Here is the uh, Fauci distress scale, uh, which Bob mentioned in his presentation. Here is a model as a, an observation archetype, which I would be able to deploy in an open, open air CDR within about three or four minutes and have that uh, recording uh, Bob's thankfully somewhat uh, positive uh, uh, feelings uh, about the world uh, within another matter of minutes. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is Thomas Gornick and I'm a board member at OpenEHR. I've been using OpenEHR for more than eight years, initially building software on top of the concept, but in recent years, promoting the OpenEHR idea to the international community. Today, I'd like to talk about data for life. Now, Bob in his keynote talked about physician burnout, and we all agree it's a huge issue. And of course, we also agree that the EHR systems of today um, are playing a large part in uh, burning out the physicians. Now, another thing that is clear is that the COVID uh, pandemic has really put our focus on the quality and availability of health data. In fact, EY in the research paper talks about the COVID crisis providing a burning platform to accelerate the data agenda in healthcare. And I couldn't agree more. Now, EY came up with this architecture for how the future systems will be built. And it's interesting because it's very much in line with our thinking at OpenEHR. So instead of data applications and logic being siloed, what they propose is a vendor neutral data layer at the center of the architecture and then apps algorithms and app, other applications around that core to actually enable the innovation and use of efficient use of data for these new systems similarly gartner three years ago started talking about the fact that if you really want an open architecture it's not enough to use open APIs to access and exchange data. What you really want is to persist the data in a vendor neutral format. That's being truly open. And again, this is exactly our thinking at OpenEHR. Now, in terms of architecture, this new one, which I'm sure will be explained by Mike Jones in the afternoon session, talks about separating the data from the applications. Again, a key concept that we use. So let's talk about data for life. So we all know that applications store data in proprietary formats. We also know that this is true in any industry. But in healthcare, this is a much bigger problem because ideally we would like to keep data for the lifetime of the patient. Now, there is no application that will last a hundred years. So what we end up doing five to seven times during the lifetime of this data is moving it from one proprietary format to another at high cost and usually losing a lot of the data in the process. But there is a better way. And actually the imaging uh, systems have shown us how to have a vendor neutral data archive in a common format called DICOM to store all the images 
from any modality so they can be accessed using any viewer or application. If you think about the PDF, it's a similar concept uh, for documents. Unfortunately, the structured data, the data we're really mostly interested in for AI and uh, analytics is still kept in the silos of the applications that produced it. And this is what we try to do at OpenEHR, take this data out, manage it separately of the applications so that any application can consume and produce the same data. Now, where do we begin to move to this new architecture? So first, we realize that we have legacy systems which are connected using some type of integration. We also realize that we have a lot of other systems, some of them which are not connected at all. What we sometimes don't realize is that we have many of these systems. In some cases, we've seen hundreds inside a single institution. So it's quite clear that once we replace the legacy with a mega suite, these will not go away. So how do we solve this problem? What we are proposing is that as soon as you need to build a new application, something innovative, build it on top of an open data platform. Now, the reason to do that is that as you keep adding these applications, they inherently work with the same data and interoperate without additional effort. So what we end up with is what we call a postmodern EHR. Bob talked about the post EHR era. And this is something very similar. A world where we have our legacy, which runs the business, but we also have an innovation platform where we can quickly build apps and applications to help us care for patients. Now, this is very much in line with what Gartner was talking about years ago when they introduced the bimodal IT concept, where you have mode one running the, uh, the business, reliable, slow changing uh, environment, but you also have mode two where you can take advantage of the new uh, innovations and quickly build apps and applications. Now, what we are saying is in order to do that, this innovation, shouldn't recreate the same problem we have with legacy, which is that each application stores data differently. So these apps and applications should be built on top of an innovation platform that shares the same vendor neutral data. Now, if we look outside of the organization, how could we take advantage of these concepts? Well, imagine if institutions normalized their data into a common format, what you could then do is you could create a virtual personal health record for a patient, provided you had consent, to aggregate the data from all the systems using a simple query, because they would all be in the same format. Now, you will hear a talk by um, a, German, a group of German university hospitals that have done just that. So, of course, you can optimize this architecture by centralizing the data, making things much simpler if you want to, but it's basically exactly the same concept of a virtual personal health record. Now, to summarize, we have five different use cases where OpenEHR has been used. The first one is building an EHR system, and many companies have done that. Some of them you'll hear this afternoon. The second one is using the CDR as a shared care record so that you can normalize data from different systems and provide a platform for e-health. The fourth one is research, normalizing data for research, allowing queries, anonymized queries to go across, uh, putting the data together for research. The fourth one is clinical registries, which are basically a data normalization problem. So they fit very nicely with the OpenEHR concept. And the fifth one is after you have collected all this data, normalized it, use it to build apps and application on top. We, we have a global presence with OpenEHR and it looks like most activities now in Europe 
but there's definitely a lot going on in China, in Australia, in South America. And you will hear our Chinese, Chinese colleagues speak in the afternoon about the amazing amount of work being done in China using OpenEHR. So to summarize, applications come and go, but data is for life. Architectures for the future will have a vendor neutral data layer surrounded by apps and applications and algorithms. You should allow for choice at the application level but make sure you have governance at the data model level so that you don't create issues of interoperability down the line. The OpenEHR community consists of hundreds of modelers, clinicians who have built data models, which are open source and free for anyone to use. And finally, OpenEHR has been tested and deployed in hundreds of applications and systems around the world. So I encourage you to listen to the rest of the day's presentations. You will hear many examples of how OpenEHR is used around the world. And with that, I'd like to thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye.